This episode is brought to you by TwoLinedMusicCutStore.com. TwoLinedMusicCutStore.com is your all access to culture. Check out cultural merchandise like leggings, hats, mini boxing gloves, and bags. Also, t shirts like hip hop, nature, rock bands, reggae, and dark fantasy. Fast shipping worldwide. That's TwoLinedMusicCutStore.com. Now, let's check out this episode. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is Muscle, and this is another Two Line Music Cuts Entertainment Report podcast. And today, we have a really special guest in the building. Listen, this man has been in the business now for the past 25 years. You hear him on the radio weekdays from 2 to 7. That's a drive to Toronto. And then you hear him again in the nighttime. That's Made in Toronto Takeover on Flow 93.5. You know what we have in the building today? We have Ricochet in the building here, today. Here, What's here. going on, my brother? What's going on, my guy? I'm great. Yourself? I'm good. You just aged me there with the 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we're in the age of Wikipedia, in right. the age of Google. Yeah, there's so no anybody, yeah. Come on, bro. We Plus know everything. the grays are starting to pop up. So it's all, you know what? That means you're actually doing something good. Yeah. That's why you're still here. That is you facts. understand? Facts. All right. On this podcast, we like to take it right from the beginning. Right. Then bring it right up to 2021. I like that. First question for you is this. Where do you grow up in the city, and what attracted you to music? Good question. I grew up around uh, Keelan Shepard, so okay. you know, I guess you know West Side. Yeah, West Side. You know, yeah. Keelan Shepard, Jane Shepard, Jane mm-hmm. Finch. Um, and uh, what brought you? What brought me to the music? Mm-hmm. I mean, what else is there to do? You know, what I mean, two immigrant parents working mm-hmm. double shift, nobody home, mm-hmm. uh, running around in the streets. Things can go left real quick, which they did. Mm-hmm. You know to keep it a buck a bunch mm-hmm. of times yeah um but i think it all started when i was like 12 man like just watching electric circus um i seen it might have you know we were talking about mastermind yeah. off air it might have been mastermind or yeah. somebody i seen dj in there and i was like yo that looks hella hella dope yeah um and then i from that point on i'm like you know i think i'm gonna get this a go okay so you know them time they're like mom dukes would give you uh, money to go buy bus tickets <laughs> I'm like stashing that money, you know, doing like the, the, the walk to school, yeah. um, you know, and saved up enough money, copped a few turntables, and there was a goal. And there was a goal. And what type of music were you playing back then? Hip hop. Hip hop. Hip hop, yeah, yeah. What was the first hip hop record you heard and you said, yo, I love this right here? Wow. Yeah. Wow, muscle. Mm-hmm. Uh, ah. That's a good question, man. Mm. Um, uh, Eric Beef President, maybe? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was the first, like, whoa, what's this? And then, uh, I don't know if it was before or after, or maybe around the same time, uh, N.W.A., the, the Straight Outta Compton album, like, had me. That was yeah. it. <laughs> that was it. Like, yeah. uh, for some reason, somehow, I was able to have that LP. Okay. Like, I guess my mom was oblivious to what was going on on the record. <laughs> Um, and that was just like, I was like, yo, what yeah. is this? Um, it was the music, but it was also kind of like some of the things that they were talking about that I was seeing around my neighborhood that kind of, <laughs> I felt like, I mean, let's be honest, Toronto is not, um, South Central Los Angeles, right? But yeah. some of the same things I was, I was able to understand and see, and I was like, wow, these guys are talking about it in a way that nobody's ever, you know, mm-hmm. expressed, expressed that it way. like that, yeah. right? Express yourself, right? Yeah. The records. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it was definitely, you know, one of those two Mm -hmm. joints right there. When you bought your turntables and you said, okay, what was your DJ name that you gave yourself back then? It was Ricochet. Ricochet? Yeah, from the very jump. Uh, I've had my name ever since I started DJing. Yeah. Since I was 13. And I've had my phone number since I was 13. Those two things haven't changed. We were talking about that over DM, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was Ricochet. I think I was in class one day and I was just bouncing all over the place, you know, from table to desk to desk. And Mm -hmm. somebody's like, this guy's Ricocheting all over the place. And I was like, bomb. Yeah. I'm like, that's it. Because my that's name is Ricky, wild. right? So yeah. it just makes sense. Yeah, you know what? That makes sense right there. Ricky, Ricochet, yeah, it yeah. works. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. What were some and it your... sounded hella cool. Too. Yeah. <laughs> what were some of your early parties? Did you play any of the school dances? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, definitely, I think that was um, the first joint was, like, a middle school, Shouts to Alaya. Yeah. Um, middle school dance, grade seven, mm-hmm. maybe, grade eight. Um bringing the turntables, uh, going to George over at Tracks, Shakedown, mm. getting um, some Sermon Vega speakers. I can't remember yeah. whatever it was. <laughs> um, and the stringing up and, and playing a dance was actually the first dance I ever think we, we ever did. From then, 
Um, very quickly, you know, we linked up with my man AZ. So at that time, it was me and my partner Juice. Okay, um, from the beginning. Yeah, me and Juice and AZ, for that matter, um, have known each other our whole lives. You know, three, four years old. Um, still a fan to this yeah. day. Like I don't even call those guys my brethren or my friends. You feel me? That's family. family. You feel family, me? So, bro. Um, initially started with me and Juice. My my man's AZ had moved out uh, from our hood out to the Rex. Mm -hmm. He was connecting with with. Um, you know, a bunch of guys out there, and uh, he came back to the hood. He seen what we were doing, mm -hmm. and he's like, "Yo, let's make this happen." So the the uh, high school dances turned into house parties and Finch and Palisades, Eddie Stone, Driftwood Connections, uh, Maze, Our mm -hmm. Hood, like you know what I mean. Um, just in that general area, then the house party started turning into the West End, and then um, you know, like places like Joe Bananas, mm -hmm. Twenty Seven. Um, there used to be the spot down on John and Queen called Corporate Club. Okay. It was like a loft. So we were doing, we were very, it's funny, man, because us being like a hip hop sound, we got our break in the dance hall scene. That's where you got your break. That's where we were in the dance hall scene yeah. for at least five years, easily, until I was yeah. 17, 18, mm -hmm. um, heavily. Like, mm -hmm. you know, on those off days, too. Like, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday. That's where the Joe Bananas Joe and Joe Bananas, those, you know, uh -huh. Mucky Mondays, mm -hmm. like, you know. Wow. Them one that's so it's like. Yeah. That's where we were. And mind you, I had to go to school in the morning. And I'm trying to explain this to East Indian parents. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but yeah, that was kind of the move. It went from high school dance or middle school dance to to house parties to, to the dance hall scene. Yeah. Right. Like, the, uh, Did you guys come up with ill kids right away or you guys go, went through a couple no, of No, man. Names? I, think we, <laughs> <laughs> I think we went by cavemen or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the first six months. Mm -hmm. And then we were just balling up in the, in the park smoking one day. Mm -hmm. And I think we were listening to... Uh, it maybe it might have been a big L record or something. Mm -hmm. And we heard ill... I'm an ill kid split. Way, and I was like, yo... And we were just like, that's it, ill kids. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of felt like it embodied what we were about for whatever reason. You know, the, the logo was kind of greasy in the beginning, too. A screw face, you with a screw Okay, so that's, the, so that's the original logo that we see in the yellow, the yellow kind of The looking. yellow head, but there was mm -hmm. a spliff in the, in the mouth. The original one. Yeah, the original <laughs> one had a spliff in the mouth. And yeah. I guess eventually yeah. we realized that, you know what I mean, mm. club owners yeah. and, and whatever are kind of like, eh. Mm -hmm. So we, we uh, X'd out the spliff. Wow, ill kids. So you guys got your break. Back then, did you guys play along with Elite Squad? Elite Squad, for yeah. sure. Elite Squad was the, the guys to look up to from our hood. You know what I mean? From our ends. There, of course, there was Baby Blue and yeah. there was Mastermind and there was X. But really, um, for what we were doing, like those guys felt like a real similar vibe. Because mm -hmm. we both come from the same place, same situation. It was funny. I was talking to, uh, uh, I think it was Pierre the other day. Yeah. Um, via DM and, and, and I was just saying like yo man you guys were kind of like the guys we looked up to and then quickly it was like yeah. looking up to to like a target on the back but yeah. not like in a <laughs> not in no beef yeah. thing just in a competition thing we're like yeah. okay like we look up to these guys but it's like yo we have to step up our game if we're gonna get to a place where they were like mm -hmm. it's cool um, and much love to Elite Squad by the way like one of my favorite sounds of all time out of the city like some of the Elite Squad dubs I heard and yeah. things just Crazy. but um yeah, like uh, we were playing with Elite Squad, Stray Dogs, yes. uh, Black Supreme, mm -hmm. Black Reaction. Um, man, I can't even remember some of the sounds that were around them times. But yeah, any any West End sound that was around, we were we were there in the mix. You know what I mean? Doing your thing. Do you remember the first time you and Elite Squad actually played together? Yeah, you Corporate remember? Club. Okay, I was telling Pierre this story. Be <laughs> like, so we were mad young, fifteen yeah. years old. Juice mm -hmm. is a year younger, so fifteen, fourteen. So I think you're grade nine, grade ten. Them times, mm -hmm. um, those guys might be like eight years older, something like that, seven years older. And we're playing this dance at this place called Corporate Club, mm -hmm. and the man them bullied us, man, mm -hmm. like bullied us bad, dog, like to the to the thing where I was like, I just had to shrink sure. up and. You know, but it was a great lesson. Mm -hmm. The first lesson that I really understood, and it kind of stuck with us, um, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. going forward, because we were on this thing like, yo, like, you know what I mean? We're, we're from the streets, too. Like, mm -hmm. that's not going to happen again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we, we're the youngins out here. Like, you know, we're popping, too. Like, what's up? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then everywhere we went, man, like, that was... I remember we went home that day and we're like, that's never happening again. Like we're, right. we're, we're like we're bullying mans now. Like mm -hmm. that's what's gonna go on. You know what I mean? And um, and I think that's what like you know, 
it kind of left a bad taste in other DJs mouths and thing because okay. in this business if you're not on a certain level humble yourself and sit in the yeah. corner until I'm done playing and then yeah. I'll let you know when you can play uh -huh. Yote, like <laughs> when it's your time I will let you know mm -hmm. but you're not getting anywhere like that mm -hmm. you understand you like you I've seen enough man's just careers never went nowhere because yeah. they're just sitting in a corner it's, waiting it's a, it's a balance of humbleness and aggression at the exact same yes. time but you have to find that in line yes. and walk. Back then, it was it was more aggression than anything else. Mm -hmm. We took on this this uh, persona. Like I think around the same time, Mob Deep's um, album had come out, mm -hmm. um, the infamous album. Mm -hmm. And for better or for worse, that took us on a whole different vibes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we engulfed ourselves in that whole lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, some some negative things mm -hmm. came about that, but we carried that vibe with us into the DJ booth too. So if a man were like, yo, how much more records? A man was like, yo, and I'll, I'll let you know. I'm like, yeah, bro, like, uh -huh. I don't know what you think this is, <laughs> but you're not letting me know shit at this point in time. <laughs> like, you know, a little juice will come through <laughs> yeah. with the bunks, take a man's record off, put the record on, grab Rah. the mic, and just go on. Yeah. Now that created a lot of ill will with a lot of guys back then. Mm -hmm. um, I think at one point in time, guys didn't really, like, we were young as they're like, who do these guys think they are? They, they got to pay their dues a certain way, but to, in our opinion, we already paid our dues. We're coming up. Like, we, the we're not waiting that for I'm here. It means ah, I paid my That's dues. it. I'm here. Mean? We're in the same venue. Um, <laughs> I wasn't waiting for anybody to give it to us. We were just taking it. Mm -hmm. That was the mentality. We're taking Crazy. it. Crazy. So then now, as you said, Elite Squad, they okay? They kind of roughed you guys up. When did you guys meet again and said, okay, now we're big men. You guys are big men. It's on and popping. Must have been at certain dances. Like, I couldn't even remember the clubs we're at. But probably at some house parties or whatever where these guys started realizing. Um, I mean... You know, eventually you realize, like, if somebody has the wave, you you, you realize and you accept it, and you're mm -hmm. like, yeah, um, you know, we're 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 gonna we're gonna be on a level. So you know, we played a bunch of dances, and and it was just respect from that point in time. I guess really you earn the respect when you when you do your thing. Yeah. Right. Like, and when somebody sees you do your thing, and they're like, okay, like whatever I thought or whatever it was, like these guys are doing their thing, like they're on. You know what I mean? And I think those guys kind of seen. Maybe I'm, I'm maybe I'm reaching, maybe I'm not. Like they seen something, you know, in us that they seen in themselves, right? So, um, they were a tough sound to be yeah. around, though. I'm, I'm gonna be oh, honest, girl. B. They were a tough sound to be around. It wasn't no buddy buddy thing. <laughs> like, it was it was it was tough love. If, yeah. if that if that's the the way to explain it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And at that time, what rappers were hot in the city at that time when you guys were really in the up? city? They, yeah. it, it was weird because not a lot, right? Like mm -hmm. you were coming off the late '80s, early '90s, so we're we're, we're coming off the Maestro Fresh West, the Mishy Mees, um, that whole vibe. We're starting to see the rise of Ghetto Concept. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the rise of. Um, Oh uh, man, uh, Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see what's happening in the East with with Socrates and Shaq Claire. Cardi starts bubbling real quick, um, and it's just kind of the infancy or the the birth of this the next generation, the next scene of Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it was a bunch of those guys. But I think we were look, looking a lot at like the Rex. We get a GC man. Shouts to Ghetto Concept. Those are my guys. You know what I mean? Um, and I think it was those guys we were looking at and we're like, okay, these are the guys that are next, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the guys that, you know, we were trying to connect with. And, and very early on, we took the uh, the model of if we're going to do mixtapes, we're going to do what they're doing in, in the States, in New York. And we're going to draw for artists and do our own, not per se dubs, but like Exclusive, exclusives, right? Freestyles, Freestyles like, whatever you want to call it. It's the clue Ron G model. That's yeah, the model. That you know what I mean? Um, and it went from being in my bedroom, mm -hmm. um, recording all of a sudden to being in a studio real quick and really recording on like that tapes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and kind of taking the thing real, real serious. What was your first mixtape you guys put out? Ah, uh, welcome to our world. Maybe yeah. I posted something on the ground the other day. It was an ad in mic check. So yeah. we might have put out mixtapes prior to, but this was the mixtape that we printed in mass uh, amounts, packaged, shrink wrapped, yeah. ran ads for, and just like flooded the city wherever we mm -hmm. could, like to get these tapes out. So that was the first official tape, I think. Mm -hmm. And at this time, was the roles where Juice was a DJ, you're the MC, and no. AZ was the promoter? No, no, no. no. Okay, so me and Juice, yeah. DJ and MC. Okay. So when one's DJing, the other's MC. Okay, so Juice could MC also. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, things changed at that down the road. At, at that, that time, time it, was yeah. what, it was what it was. I, yeah. I was like, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm a DJ. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I wasn't an MC. I had like, yeah. I, I didn't even, I haven't even, at that point in time, I hadn't even found my voice like that. Okay. You know what I mean? I don't think the confidence was there. I think that mm -hmm. came a little as I got a little older. 
Um, I started getting really tall and shit. Yeah. Like, that was the one thing about L Kids is me and Juice are like mm-hmm. six four, six five. Yeah, so you guys are tall DJs. Big guys. Yeah. So as we started becoming men, mm-hmm. the confidence came. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, me and Juice, DJ and MC, um, and then AZ Management, promoter, mm-hmm. um, if you want to call it. Because he was the dude with all the plugs. Yeah. You know, he was plugged in with everybody. So, he was really uh, very instrumental in, like... Making shit happen for us, mm-hmm. getting us into places that we probably wouldn't get in ourselves. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think as things started getting real busy, we realized on the MC tip, we're both half ass MCs, <laughs> right? Because we're yeah. trying to do both. And um, I don't know how we decided. I think I was like, all right, like, I think we said, you know, my voice was a little deeper, it was a little whatever. And they're like, okay, you're gonna MC. Yeah. So I took on the role as a, uh, of MC because when you're in the sound, so everybody has to play the role. Of course. Yeah. yeah so, I mean. um, and Juice was just mod with the DJ thing. Like, yeah. if anybody was around them times, you know, we, we took a, a lot of inspiration as well from a guy named DJ Tab. Shouts to Tab. Of course, Tab was R- crazy. Mod. So crazy, at the end of the night, you crazy, would see Tab yeah. with like a, a shitload of records, not in the sleeves. Yeah. And he was running through like gang loads of records. Yeah. So like him, Kid Capri. We were like, yo, these these guys are like, that's the kind of vibe we're on. We're running through shit because if you're in a dance hall party, you only have 15 minutes set. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a quick set. <laughs> it's dance hall for 90 percent, and then hip hop comes on. You better shell it. And, back and if to you the don't dance shell it, yeah. they're gonna let you know. You feel yeah. me? So that was kind of the way we took. You know, we were like, okay, let's in shell mode. Let's mm-hmm. get as much records as possible in this 15 minutes. But yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Juice eventually it became where Juice was the DJ, I was the MC, and then AZ was manager. Yo, kids are doing your stuff now. So when did the mixtapes really take off for you guys? Yeah, so that first mixtape, uh, Welcome to Our World, or Famous for Negative Reasons. It mm-hmm. would have been one of those two ones. Because mm-hmm. uh, we were called the infamous ill yeah. kids uh-huh. at one point in time. <laughs> oh, to, to Mob Deep. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I think it was those two mixtapes uh, really started opening things up for us. Like, you know, very quickly we were touring Canada while we were still in high school. What? Um, things happen really yeah. quickly within about a five or six year, five year period. From 13 to 18, things moved really quickly. Why did it move so quick, especially at this time? There is no internet. So how no. did things get moving so quickly for you guys? Um, I think at that point in time, we're looking at Scratch, Baby Blue, Elite Squad, um, X, mm-hmm. Mastermind, a bunch of other guys. But there was nobody coming up yeah. that really had a wave. And ev- like... We can we come from a you know a neighborhood where we're in the streets like we're yeah. in the streets you feel me so I don't think nobody was representing that either mm-hmm. and there wasn't a voice for the streets so everybody was kind of jiggy in a dance with khakis and button up and <laughs> square fronts and all that and we're yeah. coming in AVs Deweys. You know what I mean? Like, fuck your dress code type shit. Look in the role 100%. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? We're, we look we look like like we look like where we came from. Yeah. Like, where everybody in our hood looked like, we look like that. And yeah. when we went to the club, we looked like that, too. Like, you know, to this day, a man mm-hmm. telling me, like, oh, you can't wear a hat in the club. I'm like, I, I don't need to be working here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? We're not even having those talks. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, um, so it was just, I think we embodied hip-hop at that point in time we embodied the mob deeps the wu-tangs the ready to die the biggie the reasonable doubt that's what we were on not to mm-hmm. say other people weren't on that but the big sounds with the exception of elite squad like baby blue was the total yeah, opposite for sure they're the pretty boy sound mm-hmm. right and we were the gully sound and i think uh us being that and and as elite squad was kind of moving on or out of the business we just happened to step in and mm-hmm. coming from where we're coming from, like Jane and Finch, Keelan Shepard, like really got behind us. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then with AZ being in the Rex, Rex Dale's behind us. So you guys have that whole West Side. Yeah, that whole Super West Smash. Side. And we were smashing shit. Like yeah. we were doing things that nobody was doing. Like we were smashing dances, like yeah. literally flattening shit. I was surprised at the end of the dance. I'd be like, wow. You yeah. know what I mean? And I think the talent with the the marketing and you know, and the marketing was very important. We put a lot of emphasis on how we looked. Mm-hmm. And at that point in time, not a lot of people were doing that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, Baby Blue um, had that vibe, but like they were on the pretty, you know, on on a, you they know, weren't on the goalie side like how yeah, you guys. Were. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we put a lot of emphasis on marketing and mm-hmm. getting it out there, and and you know, we were running ads in in, in um at a very young age. We yeah. were running like AZ somehow. Uh, got it, got it, got like a barter situation where we were running ads and mic check, and then we decided one day we're like. We're just going to, like, wrap a bus. Listen, you beat me to the punchline, boss. This infamous bus. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Listen, if you were in Toronto Caravan on time, this bus 
Everybody Outside, seen this bus yeah, yeah. everywhere. Yeah, especially Carabana times. What? Okay, so you guys had it before Carabana? Because I know whenever you see that bus around, it's you know Carabana it's Carabana. Time. Time. But yeah, like a yeah. week out, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? To start getting it bubbling and whatnot. What was the thinking behind that? And walk me through you guys getting a bus bus. Again, like how do we do things? Like who? Like what's? What can we do differently? Like we never thought of ourselves as DJs. We thought of ourselves as artists. You understand? Smart. So we're like, there's no difference between us and somebody signed to Def Jam. Like mm-hmm. we're the same shit, except we don't rap. We DJ. Yeah. And I think we could have very easily been rappers too. Of course. You know what I mean? Um, it just you know there wasn't no bread in it at mm-hmm. that point in time. Yeah. And the bread was coming really fast and really quick it's with the mixtapes and the dances and everything at a mm-hmm. young age. You know what I mean? I was like, wow, like, it's better than selling dope. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but it was just like, how do we make this even bigger? And and I can't remember how it came up, but we're like, yo, it's going to run us about 10, 12 bands. Uh, and I think what we did is just one caravan and we took all the money that we made and put it right back in. We just invested in ourselves. Yeah. And we're like, how do we make a stamp? We're going mm-hmm. into Carabana, which is predominantly... Uh, Calypso and Soka oriented. There's mm-hmm. not a lot of dance all going on, not a lot of room for hip hop. So it's not like you can go down, which we did. We still were, you know, managed to have our float and run tune, but like, how do we make a bigger impact? Because, mm-hmm. yes, people are going to forget that you played on the fl- on the parade route, but people are not going to forget that bus. That big ass <laughs> 52, 55 footer bus with, with the logo wrapped and our pictures and all that shit yeah. wrapped around it. Um, and then when we busted out, like I remember bringing it to the hood was yeah. one of the most proudest moments of my life, fam. Like you know, letting my mom and dad yeah. see that this is what's going on, like it's a this real thing. Bus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just we we're like, okay, when we did it the first year, it might have been ninety six, maybe I'm not sure, mm-hmm. maybe a little later, um, maybe a little earlier. But like we realized that this was the move. So you know, we took a lot of years of inve- reinvesting in ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, to make that bus happen, but that even that put the stamp on the thing. Like it was like, yo, these guys are not; these guys are here to really, you know, do it, not playing around. That's probably one of the most legendary things you could. When you think about Carabana, you think about that bus. That if you're in the city, that's what that you're is definitely in your mind. one thing. When I buck certain mans on the road, they're like, yo, the bus, fam, the bus. You know what happened to the bus? And I'm like, yo, it's parked up. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, right. yeah no, but that definitely helped us move forward and, and gave us our vibes. Mm-hmm. Right there. And did you guys actually put people on the bus or it was just a straight ah, nah, promotion? No, 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 no. There was people on There was yeah. shit going on on that yeah. bus. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some of the best times of my life on that bus, bro. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, we had we had the whole gang with us on that bus. Like, okay. all the men and, and, you know what I mean, and shorties and, and whatever. And we also, the way we finessed that bus, it was yeah. like a, uh, you know how um, uh, a band or whatever would have, like, an extra pass, permit, mm-hmm. for, like, a... Uh, uh, like a bus that carried the water or yeah. like a truck. It would be like U-Haul truck that carries yeah. the water and all the supplies. We're like, yo, we'll do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cry. We'll do that. Yeah. Because we're not, we're not like, how else are we getting on a route? So mm-hmm. we would just finesse it. We're like, we'll put the water for whatever band. I can't remember who we were with them times, but <laughs> yeah. we just put the water and shit. And if, you know, some of the, some people that are playing mass wanted to cool off for a little bit and catch some air conditioning, they can come on, which was fine with me yeah. because all of a sudden, the gal were on the bus jamming with the man in two, so it was just a good old time, you know what I mean? Yeah. And we would have a float where we were DJing on too, so like, you know, it was just a, a whole a whole vibe yeah. for a good 10 years, 15 years. That's how long you guys were running that bus for? Yeah, I think we ran that from like uh, mid-90s till about, I think the last time uh, we ran it, maybe 2010. It was a scaled-down version of it at that yeah. point in time, but it was like, okay, yeah. it's the last, maybe 2010-ish, yeah. Yeah. The last hoorah. That's so oh, crazy. That, that bus there. And were you guys actually promoting your own parties at that same time? You're also a Carabana Weekend? Where you guys were just, your thing was get on the bus and market. It was get on the bus and market. Um, it wasn't until a little while after, until I linked up with uh, Chris from BMW. Mm-hmm. Where he kind of took us under the wing. Because AZ was more management than mm-hmm. promoter. Although he did do a few dances here and there. But he was more a businessman than, than a promoter. And then we hooked up with Chris. And he mm-hmm. kind of put me onto the vibe of like promoting mm-hmm. prior to that i had linked up with uncle b yeah. a little bit too um and it was like that's when we started like hitting the all ages scene really heavily okay and like putting on you know dances but usually on carabana um the dances that we did didn't come around until we started owning our own club and shit you know it was always just like playing for other people or mm-hmm. whatever yeah no you guys took it as i said the bus I know that you guys were involved with some parties too, and even club. What was the club that you guys were involved with? So it was originally Karma, 
where I was a, a marketing manager there, and then it went bankrupt. Yeah. And then the opportunity came to just buy the club. So uh, a couple and of this us, is the one out by the airport. That, and yeah, right now I in guess the, it's the double tree right yes, now. Yeah, yes. Dixon yeah. and and Martin Grove there. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a big ass club, right? Mm-hmm. It was like twenty thousand square feet. It's huge. It used to be a movie theater. Yeah. Um, so Karma went bankrupt, and the opportunity arrived. And I'm like 22, 23 years old at this point in time. The uh, opportunity arose for us mm-hmm. to to buy the spot with a few other folks, and we're like, "Yo, if we're really gonna up it, yeah. that's the way to do it." And we just went in, and we ran that for about mm-hmm. two, three years until the Hilton came around and, and mm-hmm. bought us out. And that was a game changer, right? That was like, mm-hmm. who's doing this? Yeah, like we had never seen anybody, any of our peers do this. And not, I think that was some a of the DJ motivation. Or even a because prom- club owners were usually some people from you don't know them. Right. You're not really they cool from with them. Where we were from, they didn't look yeah. like us. No. You know what I mean? It was yeah. we were playing by their rules, and I yeah. think that had a lot to do with it. I'm like, you know, I think we're sitting there like, yo, we're sick and tired of playing by other people's rules and mm-hmm. other people telling us how we should conduct our culture, like mm-hmm. how we should play and what songs we should be playing and how we should dress and yeah. how we should run things. And I think the only thing that made sense is like we just got to do it ourselves. And that was always the mentality of ill kids. Mm-hmm. All right, you don't want to put us on the big dance? We'll no problem. It. We're doing the big dance. You don't want to put us on it? No problem. We're putting ourselves on the on the on the bus on the parade yeah. route, and it was just like a do it ourselves mentality from the very jump. Mm-hmm. And that's Crazy. where that, that's where the nightclub Crazy. thing came in from. When did you guys get involved with the radio? Early, yeah, mad early. Um, so AZ was volunteering at CHRY, which is now Vibe One Hundred Five. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I was in grade 10, 11. Um, and then the opportunity came to do the overnight show. Mm-hmm. I think it was Wednesday nights, two to two a.m. to seven a.m. Uh, and then I think Presto and Dio seized Island Explosion. Yeah, it was Wednesday night because Island, yeah. Island Explosion was it was in the morning time. Mm-hmm. And um, and he's like, "Listen, I, we can get on radio, but it's like the night shift." Mm-hmm. And we're like, "Yeah, whatever. Like, let's do it." You know what I mean? And literally, that was a real hustle because none of us really drove. Az was out. <laughs> In the Rex or, you know, where he was. Mm-hmm. We were still in the hood. So we would literally, like, take a shopping cart load. Because you had to have crates these times, eh? You had yeah. to have crates, dog. And we're rolling yeah. to the radio station with three big recycling bins. You know what I mean? Or two at the very least. Mm-hmm. So we would take the um, IGA shopping cart, <laughs> bring it up 10 flights in yeah. the elevator, load up the records, bring it down, take it to the bus stop. Unload it at the bus mm-hmm. stop, mask the, the thing because you need that when you get back. <laughs> Otherwise, you're, you know what I mean? Um, mask the, 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 the shopping cart, yeah. hop on the bus, and take the 106 to York University. Um, that's what the hustle was. Like, it was like whatever, you know, that's any means easy. necessary. Yeah. And then take those crates to school. We went to school at Jeffries. Mm-hmm. So we take the 106 back to school and then find a place to put the records. Eventually, they let us put it in the office. Eventually, it ended up being we got, we went from overnights to morning, 7 to 10. Mm-hmm. Somehow my mom and me convinced my teacher to give me a credit <laughs> because I would miss, I would yeah. miss the, um, the, the first, first period. The first period. Mm-hmm. Uh, end up getting a credit for it because it's a volunteer situation, right? Yeah. It's kind of like a co-op thing. And then they just let us in. They would hold our records till the end of the day. And then end of the day, pack up the records back on the 106, mm-hmm. go find a shopping cart, go <laughs> load up the cart, <laughs> bring it back to the building. Me. Like that was that's, awesome. That's insane to even think. When you look back, do you really realize what the hell you guys were doing back then? No, I've yeah. completely forgotten half of this until yeah. me and you were having this conversation, <laughs> to be honest with you. Like, I yeah. mean, it's buried back there, but mm. I just can't see people doing it. And we're, we live in different times. Mm-hmm. Youngins these times, they're having their wit. Money's mm-hmm. right. Like, the internet's around. Like, there's no excuse there's not no to excuse. get money. You can get money. Back yeah. then, it was a little tougher. You know, you had to get money different ways, and yeah. it wasn't as easy, right? So, I mean, we didn't end up getting a car until our late teens. Mm-hmm. And uh, that obviously changed things, made things a lot easier. But, like, we are just relying on AZ to come scoop us and do what we had to do as youngins. But, yeah, like... Nah, I just can't picture that shit, mm-hmm. people doing that shit now. That's wild. And when you guys were on the radio, what was everybody's role? Who was doing what on the radio? So I was primarily the on-air. Um, Juice was obviously mixing. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we would all get on air at times. And then okay. AZ was kind of overlooking everything mm-hmm. at that point in time. You know what I mean? So um, that was the vibe for, for a long time. Until I think all of us started kind of things got really busy. Mm-hmm. You know, we we're touring, we we're playing out five, six nights a week. Yeah. And then slowly, one by one, everybody started dropping off the show. And it was me by myself, finally. And okay. Like the last one standing. And I think, yeah, even for me, 
um, you know, the nightclub had come around and I was like, all right, this had run its course for me. Like everything we were going to do on radio has been done. At least that's what I thought at the time. In hindsight, sure. I probably would have stuck around mm -hmm. and, and kept it, um, kept doing it. But it was just, it came to a point where it was like, things just got too busy and we let the radio go. How long were you guys on air for? Uh, I would say we were on air from when I was 16 to 22, I want to say. So good six, yeah, solid yeah, six yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, good six years. And you guys were owning a club yeah. in your young 20s. 22 is when, yeah. 20, I was 22 when we bought the club. That's insane to even think about something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it was like when I, when I think about it, I'm like, oh, that's what you're supposed to do. But in, in hindsight, yeah, it was kind of crazy. You know what I mean? It wasn't cheap. I don't even know how I got bread together. I got it together, you know, to make it happen. You know what I mean? But yeah, no, it wasn't cheap. We we're doing that plus the bus and and all that, and we we're bringing in you know acts and. But it was the only way. Like that was the only way that we were pushing forward what we wanted to do. Like I'm being honest with you. Like at that point in time, Baby Blue was in, in our like crosshairs. Yeah. Because um, you even said touring and stuff, because you're the ones that toured, they put out albums yeah. and stuff. What was your first tour like as Ill Kids? Now you guys are really coming out of Toronto, because remember, in, in our mind, everywhere in Canada is exactly like Toronto. Absolutely not, yeah. though, right? <laughs> you understand. No internet. Yeah. No internet. So mm -hmm. um, how do people hear about you? Yeah. It was just we were doing our thing, and I, I got to give it up. Baby Blue really opened up the door okay. for touring mm -hmm. and for big money touring, mm -hmm. too. We're not like, because we were able to go in just a little under Baby Blue, and they were paying. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, but I think, you know, Baby Blue was touring, and I think that led a lot of people to say, like, what else is going on in Toronto? Yeah. And I think because of our marketing, because of the bus, because of the radio, because of other things, um, you know, it got promoters curious. And shout to my guy Vince out in Edmonton because he was the first guy to line it up. And it's a crazy story because we were going to be gone for what I think is like almost 10 days to two weeks in the okay. middle of the school year. Yeah. Um, you know, I come from an East Indian family. Um, Juice is Jamaican. So it's like our parents are not like about that shit at all. At all. School mm -hmm. is what is important. Mm -hmm. um, somehow, though, I convinced my mom to come to school with me and she convinced the principal to take me out of school for two weeks to do this, which the principal was not feeling, right? They're yeah. like, yo, what is this, this What is this hip hop shit? Like, mm -hmm. this is crazy. But my mom believed in me. My yeah. mom from the jump really believed, I think her thing was, this will keep my son out of the streets. And it did, for the yeah. most part. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was some flip flop in here and there. It took me a while to realize that I don't need to be in that, that's not my thing. Yeah. Um, but I think that was her thing. She had seen, obviously she sees what's going on around us. Uh, she knows that she's not home, my dad's not home. And she sees me coming home, and I'm in the bedroom. Yeah. She's like, and I'm just DJing, me and Juice, just making yeah. mixtapes. She's like, how long you guys been here? We're like, yeah. I don't know, six, seven hours? Do you guys eat? So she's mm. seen, like, okay, this, they're in the house, they're doing something positive. So my mom mm. believed in, in the whole vibe. I think she may, I don't know how that went down. AZ might have convinced Juice of that, but... Um, you know, we had to get written uh, permission <laughs> to leave school. And we hit the road, yeah. man. We hit, I think it was Alberta and BC at first. And what was that like actually going out there for your first time? Vibes, B. Yeah. I was feeling myself heavily. Um, it was interesting because nobody talked or looked like you in those ends. They had their own things going on, right? Because how far is Toronto from Calgary or Edmonton? Buddy, that's you can't drive there. You no. have to fly You have there. to fly there, yeah. right? And never mind, you have to pay like three, four hundred dollars just to bring Girl, your records. Crazy! I yeah. don't at that time. <laughs> yeah, you gotta bring. You gotta. Your record is a whole yeah. next <laughs> airfare. So there's four airfares yeah. going to these places. Um, but it was vibes because people were so interested to to know what was going, like the way you talk, the way yeah. you dress, the way you carry yourself is different. You know what I mean? It's that Toronto vibe, and that was only Toronto at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it was mind blowing. It really gave me insight to know that this is a real series because this is before we own the club this is i'm talking like 16 17 years old um uh, and it really made me realize at a very young age that yo this is it yeah like school's cool i'll finish school that's what my mom wants to do i'll try to do some post-secondary but like i've already figured out what my career is going to be i found something that works found something that works and then i'm making money yeah like i'm making pretty good money at this age uh, I'm making just as much money as people who have full-time jobs and are adults. So this is, crazy. this is something that, you know, my mom seen, the bread was coming in, everything was legit. And I realized off of that tour, I'm like, yeah, this is, I'm not, this is, nobody's taking me away from this path. This is what yeah. it is. And it was just like, great. You know what I mean? Like, it's just things that come along with a tour. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you know, you know. Yeah, we're yeah, young. Just, and, you know, it was yeah. 
big women coming around. I was just like, jeez. <laughs> you know, you know, probably lied about my age or whatever. But remember, you're from Toronto, so you're from the big city. And it's either if you know it or not, they make you know right away that, hey, you're not from here. Yeah. And we like you because you're special from right. the big city. Right, right. And that was the case. You know, uh, that was the West Coast. And then very quickly, Ottawa and Montreal mm-hmm. and Windsor and London and places where you can get in a car and drive. Yeah. Like, Montreal was real big for us. Yeah, but Montreal's a party city. So Montreal's then- a party city, but we took advantage of that, of the mm-hmm. fact that Montreal's a party city. It's a five-hour drive, and we would shell. Like, we had a real, like, I remember pulling up in Montreal and seeing a huge lineup and people being like, because in Toronto, you pull up to dance. It's cool. Everybody's yeah. like, yo, little kids are there. Ah, yeah. ah. In Montreal, they're like, yo. Yeah. <laughs> You're excited. You yeah. know what I mean? And we really took advantage of that. We really put some strong uh, shouts to Gary T, Ricky D. Um, some of the real OGs out there who really believed in us and 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 made it happen. So I think we quickly found that we can branch out in Canada and even spread our our roots even further. And mm-hmm. that's exactly what we did. Crazy touring, so you guys at clubs, touring, crazy marketing, the bus, everything. Did you guys actually produce an album or anything? We were working on an album. Yeah, we worked on an album. Uh, it's funny. Somebody sent me the vinyl yeah. the other day. Uh, we worked on it. You know, that's one of my regrets yeah. in life um, is that we never took producing seriously. But it's almost, that seems like the natural step where you go. It was. Um, but I think, you know, one foot was in the streets, one foot was in the club. And the negative shit that was going on was just taking us away from the things we should have been doing. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that I should be like, moving a certain way until I was 24. Mm-hmm. Something happened, and I was like, all right, man, mm-hmm. I'm done with this. Like, you know what I mean? This is it. Mm-hmm. Um, some other things happened with partners and whatnot. You know, people went away for a little bit and whatnot. And um, it's just like we never were focused enough, unfortunately, mm-hmm. um, to get into the production side of things, which is, like I said, one of my biggest regrets. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because you see now, I think, you know, who knows? That would have, who knows what I would have been doing to this point in time. But we worked on a, on a couple joints. But the thing is, we were perfectionists. Mm-hmm. And that hurt us bad. We wanted our stuff to sound just like Biggie's stuff. We wanted our stuff to sound like Jay-Z. And, and remember, at that time, to get that type of sound, you need a huge studio. And we were spending. Yeah. We were going into the big studios mm-hmm. and spending money. Yeah. And that was something as well. We're like, fuck, man. Like, mm-hmm. I like making money. Yeah. And we're just, and we put out a few records. And at that point in time, Nobody had really made a lot of bread. Out of music. Out of that music, kind of day, right? Yeah. Baby Blue started making yeah. some bread with their deal, uh, but we weren't Baby Blue. That yeah. was the reality. You know, Baby Blue was nice and polished and marketable for the record labels at that point in time. I don't mm. think they looked at us in the same way. Yeah. I think they looked at us like, eh, mm-hmm. you guys are a little too greasy, right? Who did you guys record? Who did you guys put out some songs with? Uh, Tef and Don. Mm. Tef- Berg, I haven't Big heard that Berg. name in forever. Uh, Blue Scorpion, a lot of Rex guys. Um, I think we recorded something with Citizen Kane. I think mm-hmm. GC Ghetto Concept did something for us. Um, it was just a bunch of a bunch. I think the the main record was Tef and Don and Amy, this girl Amy. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just kind of like we. I don't. I, I mean, we digged it, but I think we were like, this is not the sound. This can't compete with what's going on in America. And we just let it be. You know, I don't think, you know, people realize that this is a thing until Drake bust. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And them times, I'm a little older, and I started rocking with Belly and CP Records and went that route for a good 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Okay, so you were in Ottawa or Belly had came to Toronto at that time? Right? Uh, um, so that whole thing went down where uh, the Stylus Awards came. So now fast forward, 2008, 2009, mm-hmm. where the club is, is, is now gone. Uh, we're continuing to tour. Um, continuing to do our thing, you know, five, six nights, DJing. And then the, St- and then the Stylist Awards came around, mm-hmm. and uh, we ended up winning a few years in a row. Yeah. And that's when my guy Cash, we happened to be in the same room somewhere, and he's like, yo, well, you know, you should come kick it with us and, and whatever. And at that point in time, when Belly and Cash and Sal and CP Records came to Toronto from Ottawa, it was a mm-hmm. heavy thing. These guys are pulling up heavy, like big. You know, they were pulling up with Apple, and Apple's kind of, 
showing him around the city and we were seeing him and, and Belly had these big records with these big artists. Like what Now the that's the guy where yeah. it's like, yes, Cardi was doing his thing, mm -hmm. but now here's this guy, Belly, who's like, they're really about their shit. Like, and especially out of nowhere, it's like, hold on, we're the big city. How is this guy coming from Ottawa with all these crazy features? Right. Crazy videos. Like those guys are not doing going it through, out there, right? They're they were, not going through. They were um, not like no factor. joke thing. Yeah. Like those guys are the real deal, right? So they were doing it. They were doing their thing out there and they come to Toronto. I ended up linking up with Cash and uh, it was just vibes. And then they kind of like brought us in as part of the team. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of where things also started straying for ill kids. Yeah. Because I had the vision of like, I'm riding with these guys. And I was able to humble myself a little bit to know that, mm -hmm. okay, now I'm not the big dog here. Like, you know what I mean? I have to know my role here in the situation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is something that I learned around them times to humble and have some humidity, uh, mm -hmm. humility. Humble yourself and have some humility. Prior to that point, we might have been a little cocky and been a little feeling ourselves <laughs> and doing wild <laughs> shit. Yeah. I get in, in, a, in, a, in a situation with these guys and I realize that this might be the move for next a while. And I don't think everybody shared this. At that point in time, AZ had come. He's like, listen, guys, like, after 20 years or whatever it was, 15 years, he's like, I think I'm going to fall back. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then um, I don't know if that was Juice's vibe at that point in time or not. And I just kind of continued on with CP Records as myself. So that mm -hmm. kind of around that time, it's not easy to maintain a sound. Like, yeah. I think, and I don't know, I think we might have been the longest running hip hop sound in Canada. For if you're gonna put on those type of years, yeah, because yeah, Baby we, Blue wasn't even really around that long. No, ago. we got up to like uh -huh. I think we just shy of twenty years, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Definitely, 18, yeah, 16, yeah. 18 years. But I attribute that to the fact that we are family. We mm -hmm. weren't friends. Mm -hmm. We had known each other since kindergarten. Yeah, you know, babysitting in the same places, like you know, like so. I think that had a lot to do with it. But eventually, everything good comes to an end, yeah. and we just we weren't we weren't on the same page. Um, I don't think, you know, I think we thought of things differently. We wanted different things. And it kind of got to a point where it's just like, it wasn't fun anymore. Yeah. And when you stop having fun together, you got to realize before this hurts your personal relationship, mm -hmm. let's just call it a day. Call it a day. So yeah. we, me and Juice, at that point in time, AZ had gone. Um, guys had come in and out of the sound mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years. Okay. But I mean, at the end of the day, it was me and Juice, right? Yeah. I mean, Trix was part of the sound at one point in time. Future the Prince played a hand in Ill Kids okay. while somebody just, somebody was away for a little bit. Future yeah. filled, you know, filled in some shoes and kept the sound going with mm -hmm. us. And Trix was a, a secondary MC when we were taking double bookings. And he was Did a major part. Was yeah, a yeah, yeah. Trix was yeah. a big part of Ill Kids for yeah. better part of eight years, six years maybe. Um, Future, The Prince as yeah. well for a couple of years kind of played a role in the sound here and there mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day it was me and Juice and you know we just figured at this point in time let's just call it a wrap call it there and when did Weekend get involved with the Belly situation? Um, it, was, it was crazy I was at Belly's house one day out in Saga by Square One and in comes The Weekend and he had just dropped House of Balloons and um, you know things were bubbling but this is yeah. before Drake had tweeted out about The Weekend okay and I think it was just because um, you know, Drake was hot already. At this yeah, point oh yeah, yeah. Right. Drake was on already. Yeah. Um, and we had our we had a relationship with Drizzy as well. Like mm -hmm. he was on a bunch of our mixtapes in the early days and, yeah. and whatnot. Um, you know, I really from the first time I heard his, his mixtape, I was like, "Yo, this guy's gone." And we just wanted to involve everybody in the city to what we were mm -hmm. doing. Um, but uh, when the weekend came in, I was just I was just witness to all this. Like yeah. I really didn't have any play or any part in that. I was just around to see what was going on. At that point in time, I was Belly's DJ. I yeah. was uh, uh, Jordan's DJ. Danny Fernandez. I was just mm -hmm. the the, the in-house DJ for CP. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the relationship just you know just everybody understood each other, and they just vibed. Especially B and Abel, especially Belly and Abel. They were vibing hard. Yeah. Um, and that relationship just took off, you know. You know, cash. There's, there's everybody played a part for that thing to come together, and I think management at that time wasn't able to do what cash and Sal and and and, and CP was able to do. So, yeah. you know, that relationship grew. Um, I had gotten married, I think, a little while after that, mm -hmm. and I wanted to pull back a little bit. And uh, everybody had moved to LA, and CP turned into XO. And I'm still like really, you know, cool with those guys. That's the family over there. You know what I mean? Did Nav get involved from earlier? Nav came in no, later. No, that was while I was, you know, yeah, back here in Toronto. That happened mm -hmm. with 
XO. I have nothing to do with anything of that. Mm-hmm. But okay. it's great to see him yeah. part of that. You know what I mean? That's so wild. Just to, it's always the beginning stages are always the craziest, especially when you look back when people got far. Yeah. That's the craziest. There was some crazy nights, man. There was some crazy nights, man, at the studio and at Belly's house. I was able to witness a lot, and I'm grateful, you know, for that opportunity mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Crazy. So when did you know get back into radio? So um, after the whole CP stint, that ran from, I think, 2008 to 2016, 17, 18. Okay, so it was a, it was uh, it was a, a 10 year. It was, I was with those guys for 10 years. Um, you know, and that gave me opportunities to see places I never would imagine seeing. Like we were in Albania, uh, Romania, Hungary, Germany, France, uh, just places I never thought that, that this would take me. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were able to tour someplace in the States, Canada, Bahamas, you know, um, the islands as ill kids, but mm-hmm. we never thought of Germany or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And um, hooking up with those dudes, uh, especially with Masari, I was able to do that stuff. So that was just like a crazy experience. Mm-hmm. But um, that also took a toll on me because I was also touring as well. I think I was in Newfoundland uh, every Saturday or every third Saturday. I was in Montreal at that point by myself, too. Because you still have your brand I'm as still Ricochet. Running, I'm still running as Ricochet, them. and I'm still running as Ill Kids. Yeah. So me and Juice had agreed that we can both use the Ill Kids brand yeah. as we want it. And I ran with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was like, I'm, I'm still going with this. Um, so I was still, I was in, I think, um, Montreal. Like At one point, I was in Montreal every Friday. I took a residency every Friday. So I would fly in at like the last flight at 10 yeah. and fly out on the first flight at like 5.30. Mm-hmm. And we'd go to the poker house like after the club and burn three hours before I had to go to the airport. Yeah. Uh, and we were doing Newfoundland and then Vancouver. And it was just, it was, and, and along with Europe. And I just found myself, actually, it's a crazy story. I don't, I don't think I really said this to anybody, but... Mm-hmm. I found myself in a hotel room by myself. Mm-hmm. Might have been off of like two mollies, like a bottle, <laughs> like God knows what. Crazy. Just crazy. And came off of Europe, came back to home. Didn't really get to spend any time at home. I think I remember actually uh, wifey giving me a new suitcase. I gave her the old one and I hopped on the next flight and I was gone. That's crazy. But that took a toll on me. When I got uh, to the uh, hotel after the club, like I was like, like, I get now how you hear crazy stories about people take, taking their eye on shit. Now, I didn't go that far. <laughs> but, but you I could had, understand. I had a breakdown, bro. Yeah. Like, I had a breakdown. I'm not mm-hmm. going to lie. Like, I was like, yeah, this is taking, this is way too much for me now. Like, this is, at this point in time, it had been like 23 years, 24 years of drinking. And it's just a yeah. big, it's a one fucking long party. Yeah. Like, let's be honest. It's two decades of just one long party. Nah, it's crazy, bro. Um, and at that point in time, you miss out on things. People mm-hmm. stop inviting you to things, mm-hmm. right? Like birthday parties and because bowling. Because they, they figure you're, you're, you're Busy. Either too cool or you're busy. Are you busy? Right. So I wasn't even getting to see my friends anymore. I'm seeing like social media's on now, so I'm seeing all the shit they're doing. I'm like, do I even have any friends yeah. anymore, or is just a bunch of groupies around mm-hmm. and like, what's going on? And uh, I think at that point in time, I had made the uh, decision that I'm done. Okay. Like I gotta come back home and I gotta spend some time at home. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Luxy had come up, an opportunity yes. for me to be a, a manager over at Luxy and okay. help them do it with, with what they were doing. So I had done that for better part of four or five years probably. And I had met Mastermind there. I had booked him for something. And me and him got to talking. And he's like, yo, like, did you go to school? I'm like, yeah, I went to school for radio. You know, I was like, whatever. He's like, you went to school for radio? Like radio, radio? I'm like, yeah, I went to Seneca for a year, yeah. whatever. And he's like, yo, we're looking for somebody on the weekends. Mm. And it's crazy, man, because since the inception of Flow, like we had always uh applied or tried to get a show there or try to get on air we figured that we deserved to be on that station and it just never happened for whatever reason i don't think the people that were leading that station at the time were they were still stuck in their head of what they thought we were and that's what it was but once you're on the inside you understand one thing that it all comes down to relationships oh yeah everything this whole business my whole career the reason why I, I, I'm at this part of my life and still in a club three nights a week and still being able to do shit is relationships. 100%. You got to pick up the phone and, and talk to people. You got you to be in front of people's faces. Otherwise, in this business, you don't exist if there's no relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, it just had come up with, with Mastermind. And I'm like, yo, I tried to apply it. Flow, they're not fucking me over. He's like, listen, yeah. get me a demo. I'll get you in the door. Yeah. At this point in time, I'd never been on commercial radio. I've been out of radio for a better part of 18 years, 15 years. And I'm like, all right, let me give it a go. But being an MC, you know how to talk. You know how to. So I was able to put together a demo, and lo and behold, they're like, all right, we're putting you on the weekends. Yeah. Um, but shortly after, the station flipped to some old school station to the Move, mm-hmm. and I was like, I didn't sign up for this. Like, 
It's not that I didn't love radio, but I love the culture. Yeah. I love the music. That's what which, I'm here which for. Which is the new stuff. You you lived the '90s. You yeah. lived the old school. Now you're trying to live the new school at this point, right? Yeah, not trying. Mm-hmm. Not Why? trying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, it's crazy because yeah. a lot of people uh, don't embrace mm-hmm. uh, the present. Yeah. Like, like, oh, it's this trap shit. Yeah. This is it's only shit. Biggie, Biggie, and those yeah, guys. Yeah, what is this? They're mumbling. Yeah. Uh, not me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I you love like hip hop. I like the shit. This is what I like. If I'm going out, that's what yeah. I want to hear. I want to fucking stand on a couch with yeah. a thousand dollar bottle as well and, and do dumb <laughs> shit and maybe regret it the next morning. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Um, but like, you know, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, and the f- station had flipped and I was just like, this is not my thing. So I fell back. And then when the station came back, mm-hmm. they called me and they're like, listen, we're going back to hip hop. Uh, Mastermind had gave me a shout The PD had given me a shout And there was this whole inception Of the Made in Toronto takeover When I heard that I was like I'm sold So they ended up giving me uh, A full time mm-hmm. At that point in time So now I'm off of weekends Station's back to hip hop And I'm on air Like six days a week Or five days a week Or whatever it was At that point in time Crazy You brought it up The Made in Toronto Yeah What would you say Are your five No let's break it down Your three Favorite Made in Toronto moments Three favorite made in Toronto moments. Mm-hmm. Wow, B, that's tough. Um, you know, the interviews, you know, chopping it up with dudes. Um, Rochester was a good moment. Reason being is me and me and uh, Juice, his name is Juice yeah. as well, uh, go back. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I was, I was always a fan of him. So being able to talk to your friends on air is just good vibes, you know? So uh, talking to him, uh, chopping it up with Nav. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think we're both uh, East Indian. We both come from, um, I don't know what you want to call those neighborhoods. Like, I hate to say at-risk <laughs> neighborhoods or whatever the, hood. the fuck. We come from the, the hood. hood. Yeah. Him coming from the Rex, me, yeah. you know, coming from where I come from. Mm-hmm. So, and him being the younger dude, right? Yeah. And being able to see, like, I ever think there would be an Indian guy yeah. rapping and be on like that. Crazy. And that's kind of aspirations that I think I always had in, in the back of my head for myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cuz I was able to drop some bars when we were in the park and shit, yeah. you know what I mean? Okay. Um but to see that, it was a really dope interview because A, uh we all know the same people, right? And then B, we kind of come from the same background. So that was a dope interview. And um and I think just one of the uh, when the when the takeover started, it started as a, a celebration of Toronto's birthday. So on March 6, 2018, we ran from, this happened for a few years before it turned into like a regular show, mm-hmm. um, where like from 6 in the morning to like 12 at night, I remember. whatever it was, it was like from morning to night mm-hmm. all day long, yeah. we were just playing joints from Toronto and people were coming in. So, you know, to have, to be there and witness that and, and be doing back-to-back interviews and the whole vibe and the whole appreciation of it and for to see something special that's never been done like no media like major media outlet has ever given us that look no and i say us because you know what i mean yeah. that it was us mm-hmm. um so to be a part of that and to see that turn into a uh, daily show was probably that that third moment that was really special <laughs> crazy out there you spoke to a lot of toronto rappers in the made in toronto which who is a toronto rapper that we lost that was really special like this guy was right on the cusp of going there uh that's i don't even have to think about that it was houdini Mm -hmm. um i remember him coming into the studio um maybe six months before he died maybe it was a year Um, Mm -hmm. it's hard to keep track of time and i realized at that point i'm like oh this guy's different this guy's different like just a, just a vibe like this guy's going places and uh, we had a great conversation on air and off air um, and then you know you know the rest which was a damn shame right mm-hmm. but it seemed like one time like rapping was the most hazardous occupation in Toronto at one point it might still be though yeah, right? <laughs> yeah it's, it's wild out there it's just especially remember you seeing it coming from vinyl to the mixtape era right. to now it's in the streaming era right. so it's like if they could only see where you're coming from they would understand yo fuck that leave that alone we're out here to make this well don't get it twisted right don't get it twisted yes there's street rap and drill rap that exists you know and I think a lot of people assume that that's what Toronto rap is because yeah. that's what you see in the blog page. true but let's not forget uh, Havaya Mighty let's not forget Dylan Ponders let's not forget everybody else who's doing their thing that has nothing to do with the streets mm-hmm. or has nothing to do with ops or has mm-hmm. nothing to do with anything uh, A.R. Like Paisley A.R. Paisley, A. R. Paisley. Yeah. the list can go on there's mm-hmm. a whole other scene and I urge people mm-hmm. to go down that 
that that that rabbit hole and and explore Toronto for what it really is. Yes, it's it's a it's it's it's, it's there's all kinds of shit happening. You know, there's just John who uh, you're gonna hear a lot from. I think in the near future, just a lot going on. And there's yeah. street rappers who don't have any polys. Yeah, who have no problems with nobody, and they're making good music, and mm-hmm. they're still talking hood shit. Yeah, they're just not talking about smoking Ops. somebody. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. So you know, when we say rap is a hazardous. Um, career or whatever Mm -hmm. it's not rap it's the streets that are hazardous Mm -hmm. and it just happens to be that some of the street guys are becoming rappers to get themselves out of the situations that they're in but like i said me even as a dj not even that deep like that Mm -hmm. i in my i know it wasn't as it 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 took something for me to realize like okay let me get out of the streets and some of these guys they can't they can't do that right Mm -hmm. until it's too late sometimes you know what i mean with your interviews you do on your daytime drive right now right Three of your favorite unforgettable interviews. Three of my favorite. Uh, Lil Kim. Yeah. Okay. Amazing interview. Yeah. Uh, it was just like talking to a friend and like it's Lil Kim. So we're talking about the biggie. We're yeah. talking about the bad boy, the golden era of bad boy. That was a, I think me and her could have chopped it up for hours. Yeah. It was, you know, um, the Migos, probably my biggest interview. Um, mm-hmm. See, you did that uh, a couple weeks ago. No, I did that uh, last summer. It was last summer. You know, it's crazy. So it's twice you did it then. No, uh, mm-hmm. you may see me repost some shit yeah. or whatever. Um, you know, it's crazy because this pandemic has uh, opened up a lot of opportunities. Because prior to this pandemic, you had to get people in the studio. They had to be in the city, in the studio, and that's how you're chopping it up with them. Yeah. With this pandemic, Zoom pops up. Everybody's on Zoom. So now artists can, they're like, yeah, you are, sure. I'm talking to, they can just line up yeah. six hours or five hours where they talk to people from different markets and you get 30 minutes with them and you just chop it up. So that's opened up the door for me to be able to do these interviews. So, you know, that's where the Migos comes from. I was able to talk to Juicy J and that was interesting because like, I don't think a lot of people realize how deep Juicy J is. He's not just three six mafia. He's not yeah. just a rapper. He's producing a lot of shit too yeah. and doing a lot of things. So I think um, I think yeah, Lil Kim, Migos, Juicy, Soldier Boy was interesting. That's what I was about you to ask you. What was it like talking to Big Draco? Because you know he's very unpredictable. Not my best <laughs> interview because it seemed like he was smoked out and laid out. Yeah. You know, what I mean, he, I wasn't getting the energy that I got from that I see. You know. Big Drake or Big Soldier, yeah. give you know he wasn't talking all crazy. Yeah, and uh, I don't think I pushed the envelope to get him to talk crazy Got either. You. So it was a dope interview, but yeah, I wanted to get some crazy shit out of out of Soldier Boy. But we, yeah. it was dope. He was you know. He still acknowledged he was the first to do something. I can't right. remember whatever it was. So. <laughs> Today I seen on Instagram he was the first to wear a was black, it a black guy. Yeah. 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 This guy. Yeah. Right. I don't think he takes himself too serious. No, right? Like he understands because remember he is the original internet. Oh rapper. yeah, yeah, and that's what we discussed in that interview, mm-hmm. right? Like he is that guy that really, when it comes to the internet, soldiers the first dude that you remember Respect that went viral. Or not. Yeah. That's the man, and he knows what to do to keep himself relevant. Yeah, because right? the music might not be there all the time, but yeah. What's the best thing you like about working on? But this is Toronto's only hip hop station. What is it you really enjoy about working on Flow? Made in Toronto takeover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, because it comes full circle for me. Um, our very first mixtape was all about making sure that we had Toronto artists on it. That continued, you know, went from Ghetto Concept and Citizen Kane to Drake and JD Era and Preem and Belly. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, it was always, you know, we were never afraid to be in a party, stop the music, and where other DJs wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, whether it be the first Drake record, uh, whether it be Paige's record, whoever's record it was, um, we were never afraid to stop the party in the middle of the party and, like, put on mm-hmm. for the artists in, in our city and be proud of it. And if nobody else was turning up, we were turning up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's infectious. So for that to come full circle at this stage of my career where I can do that on radio and I could do it for the next generation, mm-hmm. too. We're talking about the younger people and give them, like, where else are they? You know, a lot of people tell me something. They're like, yo, bro, I got, like, streaming and everything, but my mom heard the shit on the radio. And that was like the most, like, it was a special moment for me because my mom really, like my mom and my auntie and my family got to take in what I was doing. And no matter what I'm doing on streaming, they heard it on flow. (laughs) Yeah. And it was just that much more special. So to hear shit like that or to hear somebody say, yo, I I heard about this artist on your show and I went and started, now I'm a fan of this artist. 
so to see that you know i'm able to do that for you know the cats that are coming up or the cats that are already on right now it's mm-hmm. just you know it's just, it's just what it's all about for me it keeps me going to be honest with you for sure where does the radio sit in today's universe where there's now streaming there's youtube there's radio there's all type of stuff where does the radio sit in that whole universe i mean that's a good question right a lot of people say radio's dead radio's dead uh radio's not dead Mm -mm. radio's absolutely not dead at any given point i think there's like four million people or three million people in toronto listening to radio right yeah we have a big population here, and you got to remember one thing radio is free and there are radios in cars even myself, I'd be mm-hmm. like streaming something, and, and radio is local, mm-hmm. where streaming is not, where XM is not. Mm-hmm. That's not local. So you always kind of want to tap back in, even where, you know, even if it's for 10 minutes. Like, nobody's listening to radio for four hours straight no yeah. more, right? Like, I don't know. If they, maybe there are Unless people, you're probably unless driving you're work, around. Or driving, you're at your desk, and you have it on. Yes, but the average person listens to radios in bits and pieces, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you still want to tap back in and, and, and kind of see what's going on, right? Um and I think, you know, radio will, will continue to be relevant as long as it's free mm-hmm. and as long as it's available in automobiles, right? Now, will the technology change? Possibly. Mm-hmm. What the future of radio lies in? I'm not quite sure. But from my perspective, um, people listen, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, of course. The youngins are streaming, but it doesn't change that. The, I think we forget that the 35-year-old mom is not streaming all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? She likes, you know, what's going on in radio. The real difference with streaming and radio streaming, you have to go sometime put together your playlist or it might be put together. Radio is a more of a no-brainer. You turn yeah. it on, you leave it, that's and it. that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, when I get in my car, I might listen to radio for a little bit, and then I might say, okay, let me um, throw on Rap Caviar or whatever it is and, and take in Spotify. But I tend to go back and forth, you know yeah. what I mean? And I'm sure a lot of people do as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job. Yeah. I mean, you probably wouldn't yeah. talk to me. You probably <laughs> yeah. wouldn't want to talk to me, so... <laughs> You're right. You did a lot. What's left for you in this industry right now for you to do where you uh, never touched? Maybe back into club ownership. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I have some entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, but I think as far as the music and the culture goes, now it's time for me to maybe get into artist development, start a label, uh, because that's where my passion lies. Mm-hmm. So even if I'm doing other things, I need something that makes me happy and that's for me. Um, so I've been, you know, I've been thinking about a few artists. I just got to be make sure that I'm ready for that and that I can give that all my attention and all my time. But I think in the next few years, mm-hmm. uh, possibly a label or artist development or artist management is going to be in the books. Makes sense. Yeah. What's on your playlist right now? Who are you listening to? Who are you feeling? Uh huh. What's in my playlist? It's a good question, man. A lot of people would think it's hip hop, and it's yeah. absolutely not. I would believe, listen, when you're surrounded by something all day, generally, generally, you don't want to go home to the no, same thing. No, no. So I'm listening yeah. to hip hop on the radio all day, at yeah. night, during the takeover, and in the clubs, three nights a week. So when I get home, um, Barris Hammond's running. Okay. Uh, Bill Withers, mm-hmm. heavy on my playlist. Uh, the Doors, um, on my playlist. And then I, uh, if I am listening to hip hop, I'm going back to the '90s just to remind myself of a good time. So mm-hmm. like Mob Deep, Raekwon, um, you know, just sometimes I'll even go dig into the stuff that we forget about, um, like artifacts yeah. and, and and some cannabis and stuff. Yeah, B like sides <laughs> yeah. and and stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah, I'm not like you know, I'm listening to ESTG and Forty Two Doug or Four Two Doug and stuff too here and there. But mm-hmm. if I'm going on to my like personal playlist it's stuff that yeah. you wouldn't expect me to be listening to for sure I agree I got one last one here for before I get you ah. what's been the highest point in your career and what's been the lowest point in your career thus far um a few years ago probably for my own fault things started like listen man we're narcissists mm-hmm. <laughs> why you, know I mean? you gotta explain this one DJs, promoters, rate, like attention. Mm-hmm. You feed sure. off of attention, okay. whether you know it or not. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't, wasn't aware of it. Um, there was a point where I was in a business endeavor and that relationship ended. Mm-hmm. And I was making a lot of bread. I was making a lot of, like, a lot of bread. Mm-hmm. And I got into a weird place and I was like, man, is this, you know, I don't want to do this no more. Fuck this. Da, 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 da. And, I, and I, you know, I almost gave up. And the phone stopped ringing for a little mm-hmm. bit, too. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I was like, shit, this is over. 
uh, that didn't last very long though. Yeah. It lasted probably about three, four weeks, yeah. and then shit picked back up, and I realized like, ah, oh, no, I'm not done just yet. You're tripping. So that at that point in time, that was a little bit of low. Uh, hi, the 18 year old kid on tour. You know, I had a lot of highs, but I think that was the first, mm-hmm. the thing that always stands out that made me say I'm not coming off of this path. So that that kid, because when I get back, when I got back to school. I was the guy, yeah, like shorties that I couldn't yeah. holler at before. I was, was <laughs> they're hollering, hollering at, at me you. now. Come like, on. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, like just those high school years, man, where this mm-hmm. thing all started, where it was just like, you know, to quote the woo, you know, it was just also simple them times, mm-hmm. like simple times, you know, technology wasn't where it was now. Not everybody was a mm-hmm. DJ either. Not everybody was a rapper. Not everybody was a producer. You had to be really about that shit. Like, you had to spend money Mm -hmm. um, to either buy your records or be in a record pool, and you had to lug that shit around. It wasn't a laptop and a backpack. So it was a special moment where you really had to be dedicated to your craft, and there was money available for it because there wasn't a 1,000 DJs. There wasn't somebody out there willing to do it for 200 bucks or something, right? So. Uh, it was just it was the golden era. I don't want to be one of those guys like back in the day, yeah. but that was definitely the '90s. Yeah, you know, when I when we started was I look back at that as some of the best times of my life. Yeah. I know I said last one, but something came up. I knew you either hosted or something to do with Jay Z and Kanye West. Tell me what was that? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, we did a couple parties with Hove. Uh, a couple parties. We did the Hard Knock Life after party at Gov, mm-hmm. and it was crazy because I remember uh, Memphis Bleak was looking for weed, and I sent him out. I'm like, yo, go get this guy weed real quick <laughs> because that was our opportunity to bring the weed in there and meet those guys. Mm-hmm. So meeting Hove was smart, right, because that guy is the goat to me, um, and we were able to do that a few times. Um, and then Kanye was interesting because it was uh, the Echo Fest after party, mm-hmm. and uh I won't go too too far with this, but we were playing uh, G Spot Frequency on a Sunday. Can't remember live there, and I think it was Ill Kids, Specs, and Jay, and maybe Baby U in there. And um, so Ludacris is in the building. Lil John's in the building. This is a Kanye West after party. Yeah. And so we're warming it up. We're playing, you know, Ludacris records. We're playing Lil John records. Kanye walks in. We're like, all right, let let this guy get settled in and let him get comfortable for a little bit, and then we'll go in on a Kanye set. So. As we're lining up the Kanye set, yeah. this guy grabs the mic. So as he grabs the mic, we're like, all right, we're going off now. We're kind of waiting to go into like a whole 40-minute yay set. Yeah. This guy comes in wilding, B. This guy's talking like, what the fuck? I'm here. Kanye West is here. Y'all playing Ludacris. Y'all playing. L-. And Luda and Lil Jon standing right be- sitting right beside this guy. Hey, eh? like, <laughs> this guy's fucking wilding at this point in time. And I'm like, me and my partner were like, Who's this guy talking to? And he's, the Toronto came right back in again. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I'm like, buddy, like, mm-hmm. who are you talking to right now? And the guy mm-hmm. was going off on the mic. He's like, I'm going to go to a little ex's party where they appreciate. And I just cut the man's mic. I'm like, lock off that. And I think I got in the mic and I was like, yo, who wants Kanye in this party? And I just started talking mad wild. Yeah. You know, I'm like, yo, get this motherfucker out of here. Some, I said some crazy shit. I can't remember what it was, but I said something. And the promoter at that time comes running to me. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, yo, fuck this. I don't need none of this shit. Like, you know, nobody's disrespecting me. Like, <laughs> not, I don't in care who it is. not in my own city. I'm no not, way. especially I'm not looking like a punk when mm-hmm. I walk out of there. You know, I think some pride was involved. And he stormed out of the party. Yeah. And then, but he was on a ride, man. He went on the radio the next day. He went on a ride about something else, too. So he yeah. was just. You know. He was Kanye being Kanye. But at that time, I don't think he realized that Kanye. It was Kanye. Right, right, you right. You know what I mean? Right, right. So, Crazy. Yeah. Jay. Floor is yours. Any shout out, any big ups, anything right now, leave some contacts right now before I get you out of here. Uh, shouts to everybody that's contributing um, to the culture here in the city. Shouts to everybody that's doing it uh, for the love. Um, you know, all the OGs that are still, you know, paving the way for the youngins, all the young guys coming up. Uh, stick with what you're doing. Uh, try to stay out of the polys and the bullshit. And, and that's it, man. It shouts to everybody that shows me love. I appreciate y'all. And if y'all want to tap in with me, um, you can catch me on the Twitter, on the Gram, uh, Ricochet on there. Hopefully, you'll put a little something down there where, yeah. you know, people could catch. <laughs> yeah, bro. Crazy. And, of course, listen to me on the radio uh, Monday through Friday, 2 to 7, the Made in Toronto Takeover, Sunday through Thursday, 11 p.m. to midnight. And you can catch me on King Street. You can catch me in Saga you can catch me wherever you, I'll be at your club somewhere yelling into a mic probably <laughs> with a bottle of tequila in my hand and do it all over again week after week, week after week yeah I'm, I'm not going anywhere bro I'm here <laughs> listen muscle great freaking conversation thank Mas. you broski 
Speaking I'm a fan of, of what you do, bro. I'm a fan of what you do. The That's why we're and, and everything is just not a lot of people doing what you do. You take mm-hmm. it, like you said, you take it from the beginning to the present, which is appreciative. Everybody has a story to tell. It's just who could tell their story the best right? and who wants to listen to the story because everybody has a story to yeah, tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You understand? Yeah, we all have you can't stories. be in this business for as long as you have and not have something to say. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> yeah, you already know what it is. Ricochet. Ah, ah, ah. Thank you so very much, my brother. Thank you for having me, broski. Appreciate no it. No problem. Let, Let me know. give you an outro and get you out of here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Muscle, and this has been another Two Line Music Huts Entertainment Report podcast, and we are out. Peace. Mm. This podcast is brought to you by www.twolinedmusichut.com.